All right, VIPs, uh, let's dig in and figure out where we left off. If you saw the earlier version today where I told you I was going to come back and do a process video building a player pool because we got uh, a great question asking how to find a player pool, how to narrow the, down the choices of a player pool, how to build one, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a very, very good concept that everybody needs a firm grasp on. We all do it differently, but this is how I do it, and this is one way that I start drawing lines in the sand. We've got a huge slate tonight. You can't process it all. You're going to have to make some big cuts and just ignore people and just let it go. Um, so let's dive in. If you didn't see the first video, I went through step-by-step step, sort of hitting on how I find things and where I look. And so I'll go through slower with you. If I take the starting pitching matchups tab in the research station and I scroll over, the first thing that I personally search for is K-score. I sort by descending and I write these names down. What I'm looking for is strikeouts. Baseball's become a game of strikeouts and home runs. And yes, it really is that simple. It's not easy, but it is that simple. Strikeouts and home runs, end of story. Sorry while we had to reset the research station, but strikeouts and home runs, and that's it. That's really it. So we need to find who strikes people out. And we want them going up against teams that like to strike out right? It's not rocket science. And then we need to find players that hit home runs, and we need to find them going up against pitchers today that like to give up home runs. It's that simple. And so how do we do that? I mean, there's nothing else in baseball anymore. These They've completely taken that part of the game out, the whole make contact, beat the shift, all that bullshit is all being eradicated from the game all in the effort of getting casual Joe Blow to come to the ballpark to watch people hit the ball over the fence. I think it cheapens the process and it cheapens the game, but that's a different uh, diatribe for a different story or a different day. What we have is what we have, so it makes it actually easier to research. We're only looking for key factors. I'm looking for statistics that tell me who has power, who hits the ball well, and who gives it up, and who strikes people out, and who can't hit the ball? That's all I'm looking for. So I, look, I devised K-score a couple of years ago. K-score, for those of you that don't know, is strictly the pitcher's K percentage added to the batter's, uh, the, the team, the opposing team's K percentage. That's it. If I see, you know, XYZ pitcher strikes out 27% of batters, and this other team strikes out 23% of the time, that's a K score of 27 plus 23 is 50 or 500. 50.0, drop the decimal point, 500. Makes it look fancy, makes it look cute. 500 ends up being a good number anyway. And so there we have the magic 500 of K score. Again, not rocket science. We're looking for guys that, as, as a team's strikeout number goes up, it helps the opposing pitchers match up. As the pitcher's strikeout potential goes up, it helps his own potential on the day. I want a double green light. I want a high strikeout pitcher going up against a high strikeout team, and that's what we find with a James Paxton, um, you know, maybe Zach Gallon on short sample size, Charlie Morton to a certain degree, Matt Boyd, whatever. That's it. I mean, I can incorporate W score. What's W score? Well, W score is WOBA. It's essentially, it's not exact, but it's essentially uh, what's the team hit for Team WOBA, and what's the pitcher allow for Team WOBA, average them together, lower the better for the pitcher because the pitcher doesn't give up a lot of Woba and the team doesn't hit for a lot of Woba. It's the exact opposite of K-score when you're looking at it from a pitching perspective. That's what I use it for. So I want a team with a low Woba like Miami Marlins coming into a low Woba allowed pitcher like a Max Scherzer. It's a great matchup, double green light. Obviously, as we encounter a team that has a higher team WOBA, it's going to hurt that matchup a little bit. So it's just a, it, that's a very side ancillary statistic. It's not one of my key ones. K-score is absolutely the end-all and be-all. I use Vegas for a little bit of smarter support than I am to tell me who should win the game. And I know it tells me what team should win the game, not what pitcher should win the game. But the more often the team wins the game, the more often the pitcher's in line for the win, right? Again, it's not rocket science. So the stronger the odds, the stronger that chance that team's going to win the game, the stronger the chance is that I'm going to get the win with my starting pitcher, as long as he's not one of those stupid openers that goes out there these days uh, and is actually a starter in line to get five or six innings of work. Now, 
How do I use those things in conjunction with each other and look at a couple of other numbers? Well, this is a chart that I devised. You can do it yourself on paper. I do it on paper every morning and then just transpose it in. The salary, Vegas odds, K score, W score, bullpen, the matchup. Why matchup? Well, I want to see, I know who's a good offense and who's a bad offense at this point in the year. Baltimore, not so good. Miami, definitely not so good. Chicago White Sox, not so good. Seattle hadn't been very good lately. San Francisco, pretty weak. Yes, they're going to have their games. Pittsburgh Pirates scored whatever it was, 2,000 runs last night. But generally speaking, not a powerful offense. So I don't get that intimidated when I'm facing them if I'm in a good pitching matchup situation. Now, at Miller Park, at Coors Field, in Philadelphia, in Houston, in Cincinnati, I mean, when I see teams like that in those places, then I'm going to tend to look for a safer pitcher because it just takes a few long balls to get away from you with men on base. Next thing you know, you gave up five red runs. You know, but that's the beauty of the high strikeout pitcher because a high strikeout pitcher can give up five earned rounds if he strikes out 15. Covers that up. That's why we'll, we'll, that's why we only care about K-score. Okay? I use this other stuff as a little ancillary stuff, but I'm mostly revolving off K-score. That's why I sort by it in the research station, and that's why I list these guys in order of K-score. I don't care when it gets too low unless I start looking at game logs, which I had to do today. I mean, yeah, Paxton came off the injury list. He's been a little up and down. Morton's been pretty good. Corbin's been pretty good lately. Looks like he's fixed his ship. Flaherty, up and down. Stripling hasn't been getting the innings worth of work, but looks like he's going to get the run tonight, maybe. Probably didn't, hasn't been stretched out and maybe needs to be on a longer pitch count to actually use him, but he's only 6,500 and he's a minus 250 to win. And he's got a 500K score. I mean, take a shot on him in tournaments if you want to. Uh, Strom, not bad. Probably more consistent than Flaherty. Wheeler, Odorizzi's been good, but we Odorizzi at $9,000. I mean, is look at the numbers Paxton has. For $300 less, he's got a stronger Vegas score. He's got a much stronger K score, exactly 100 points bigger. His W score is lower. His bullpen is stronger. The matchup against, who do you fear more, the Mets or the Oakland A's? I mean, probably neither one, really. So why would I pay $300 more? Now, if I've got an extra $300 kicking around, I'm happy with my lineup, and so be it. But I'm just going through this, write these guys down, fill in these numbers, and then start looking at process of elimination. Usually these big priced pitchers are up here at the top, and I've got to come down here to the $8,700 guy, and I've got to sacrifice some case I've got to sacrifice some stuff, and I have to ask myself, is it worth it? For me it is, because I can get better bats usually with that two, dollars $3,000 worth of savings. But today, when he's already at the top... Again, I know he's been up and down lately. That's up to you to determine. I'll probably have him in a couple of lineups. I'll probably have uh, Morton or Corbin in one or two, and I'll try and do it. You know, Matt Boyd's one that didn't make the list because I just didn't want to write down 30 names, but Matt Boyd is popping into my radar today. Um, some of these other guys, Odorizzi would be fine. I'd love to pay down for a Stripling Strong, Flaherty type, but I'm just not going to run 20 lineups today. If I was, I could cover all those bases. Actually, I'm going to be on the shorter slates, and I'm going to reevaluate. So what do we do after we've found these pictures? That's just the process by which I go by. So you want to write these down and track along with me? Go for it. You can rank them just like I do, and then we can discuss who we like any given day. When it comes to the uh, bad stuff, what are the bad criteria for pitchers? I mean, notice how with these pitchers here, now everybody else is kind of dead to me. I mentioned Matt Boyd. There's a few other playables, but most everybody else is dead to me. I'm trying to cut this down to two to three guys. That's it. Two to three. I want to, and I will just take my chances today. I feel like I can get it down to out of two or three or maybe four pitchers that I'm going to have somebody in there that has a great start. That's all I care about. The others dud out, fine. I didn't have a lot of exposure to them anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's what you guys need to get to. You want to build a player pool? You got to take some stands. You got to, you got to take some chances. And you have to be not afraid to just draw the line and say to hell with everybody else. And if they go off, well, they went off. But generally speaking, as long as one of the guys in your own player pool went off, that's okay. you got to stop trying to be so perfect in a very imperfect game. I mentioned this earlier today, and I know I'm digressing, but I mentioned this earlier today uh, to another member. And when you have a foul pole 360 feet away from home plate, down the left field line, and your hitter smashes the ball and pulls it and it's hooking and hooking and hooking foul and it goes foul by two feet and it was a zero or it stays fair by two feet and it's a home run for 18 points 25 if the bases you know if there were guys on bases 
That's a big swing in your score. 20 points. Big swing. Yet, that was dumb luck. Because to hit the ball two feet foul or two feet fair was less than a tenth of a second of timing in that batter's swing. That's luck. It was less than maybe 10 RPMs of spin on that slider. Didn't break just enough to get to go foul. Instead, you know, it, it stayed fair. Okay, that's that's dumb luck. It hit within a grain of the bat, a wood grain of the bat, right on the barrel, as opposed to being a little bit higher on the bat and being a warning track shot. That's dumb luck. And it's a 20-point swing. And, and many other factors. Is the wind blowing in from right field and crossing to the left and pushed it foul or not? I mean, did the wind die down for that particular gut, you know, that particular ball where the wind was blowing at 15 miles an hour and it slowed down to 8 miles an hour and all of a sudden the ball stayed fair when it should have blown foul? I mean, this is luck, guys. We put ourselves in position to reap the rewards of short-term luck. That's the skill. I've said this before in golf. If you put me up against who's the greatest putter in golf, uh, a couple years ago it was Jordan Spieth. Put me up against Jordan Spieth, I'll go right out there in, in, on, on any putting green, anywhere, drop a ball at 50 feet. He can putt it once and I can putt it once. And in that one event, I'm likely to beat him on any given putt. But we all know he's a better putter than I am. Because if we gave him 50 balls and me 50 balls, he's going to make a hell of a lot more of them than I am. But on any one swing of the bat, on any one putt, you can beat anybody. That's the short-term luck of the game. But if we put event after event after event after event on to this, this, this long season, these slate after slate after slates of DFS MLB, the skill will eventually pan out. So you've got to understand what you're getting yourself into. But don't try to be so perfect. Instead, get good at getting close. And you get good at getting close by drawing credible, intelligent, logical lines in the sand and being okay with being wrong. So you want to pay up for pitcher, grab a Morton or a Corbin. You want to pay down, grab a Paxton or a Flaherty or a Stripling or whatever and roll the dice. Tonight, it might work for you. It might not work for you. Corbin can blow up. Paxton can blow up. Paxton can have a great night. Flaherty can give up eight runs. Okay, but over the long haul, if we ran this particular matchup of pitchers 100 times, Paxton, if healthy, is the best pitcher on the slate. He's got the best matchup, should score the most fantasy points per dollar on the slate. We flip it on its head, because I know I'm really going on and on and on here, but I'm just trying to explain to you what the deal is, how this thing works. Flip the slate on its head. By searching, by sorting, by descending order. You come down here to the poorly ranked DFSA grades. Start writing them down. Urquidy doesn't have a sample size. It's not fair to him. You know, Wojciechowski, probably similar. But Taylor Clark, maybe Gallon, Anderson, Magnan, Thornton, Karasidi, whatever, Beatty, Suarez, Odorizzi, these guys down here are not strong pitchers, typically. They have high numbers in the numbers that we're looking for over here in the pitcher stats. Fly ball percentage, that leads to home runs. Walks per nine leads to men being on base when the home run gets hit. Strikeout percentage, if it's low, it gives up a lot of contact. Home run per nine, I mean, that's obvious. How many home runs per nine innings does this guy give up? A lot? Great. Whip, walks plus hits per inning pitched. Higher number, bad pitcher. Sierra, skill independent ERA or whatever the hell that stands for. Basically means this is what the pitcher should be pitching to. His ERA is going to be different because there's a little bit of luck. I mean, is he giving up a lot of hard contact and it's just going right to the shortstop or shortstop doesn't have to move for it? I mean, that ball typically, like stat cast data shows, should have been a base hit. So it goes against his ERA on these math formulas. But in reality, it was just out. And maybe it was when the bases were loaded. And instead of giving up bases clearing doubles, he got an out out of it. His ERA will reflect what actually happened. His Sierra will reflect what should have happened. So if I've got a guy halfway through the season, they're saying at FIP and XFIP, and those all numbers are all kind of the same thing. They're predictive ERA numbers. Use whichever one you want. I just happen to use Sierra. 5.61 tells me that Tyler Beatty is a bad pitcher. 5.27 tells me that Jose Suarez isn't much better. 472, 487, 458, 509. These are all bad pitchers. Red is bad. Green is good. 
So I focus on the bad. So I scroll over here and start looking at who do I want? BD, that's San Diego. Thornton, that's Boston. Mengden, Minnesota. Chase Anderson, Cincinnati. Taylor Clark, LA Dodgers. So this is why I'm writing these teams down. But when I go back to this list, if I follow the higher numbers, the whip, the home run per nine, walk per nine, X Woba against is one you can find in some places. Sierra. If I've got a guy who's got high number here, high number here, high number here, high number here, he's a terrible pitcher. Taylor Clark, 5.09 Sierra, bad. 1.51 whip, bad. 2.11 home run per nine, horrible. Walks per nine, 3.29, bad. Struggles against both sides of the plate, righties and lefties. And he's facing the Dodgers. Only one of the best offenses in the league. So if he's, fa if he's a horrible pitcher and he's facing one of the best offenses in the league, hello. I don't care if his last two starts he held him in check. Eventually he's going to explode. Or they're going to explode on him. Might be tonight. I'll take my chances. I look for other pitchers that are in these similar situations. 5.61, bad. 1.92, bad. 7.15, oh my God, so bad it hurts. San Diego is in a good spot because of it. 4.58, 1.63, 3.3, gives up to righties. 4.99, 1.37, 1.5. I mean, these are just loading up as bad, 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 bad. Cincinnati, L.A., Boston, San Diego, Detroit. That's on my short list of stacks. So if I was starting with a stack, I'd pick one of these teams like L.A. or San Diego or Cincinnati or Boston. And what do I do? I go to the research station and I say, okay, if those are my teams and everybody else is dead, do, do, do you see Kansas City on this list? No. Don't play them tonight. We're missing Houston and Oakland, or Houston and Colorado. Uh, we're missing a couple of others that you can maybe manually override. But generally speaking, do you see the St. Louis Cardinals on this list? No, don't play them. Got them going off or bad. They're either facing a good pitcher or they suck. Otherwise, they'd be on this list. Who else are we missing? Phillies? Mets? Yankees? There's a reason they're not on these lists tonight. So draw your line in the sand and be done with it. You don't need to even research those teams, really. I'll show you how we're going to catch up to them in a minute, though. But when I'm looking at these stacks right here, write them down. L.A. Dodgers, Cincinnati, Boston, San Diego, Detroit. I wrote down those five. Okay? Write them down. Go to the research station. Go to the trends tab. Let's find the hot bats in these offenses. Take the L14 Woba. Sort it by descending. Why? Because the L7 sometimes is off from like a fan graphs or whatever. It lags by a day or so. Sometimes it makes a difference. If a guy like Josh Bell didn't update last night, his L7 Woba is going to be way different. Some people will argue that, oh, his L7 Woba is inflated because he had that one big game. Well, no shit, Sherlock. It's a seven-day sample size. I mean, come on. If you don't like that number, expand your sample size to 14 days, 30 days, whatever, to where it can kind of offset and absorb that number. It won't throw it off as much. But if you're going to go with hot batters and who, you know, theoretically a hot batter tends to stay hot for a while, then you're going to want to use a shorter sample size like L7. It's fine. Expect the numbers to be inflated. Expect the fact that a guy's going to eventually cool off and he can't sustain an 876 blow, but nobody can. 697, 674. DJ LeMahieu, 674 Woba. I mean, come on. Look at his last year and a half, 347. He's running way hot. He's going to cool off. He, to go to get down to this 347, he's going to have to hit a 210 for a while. Fine, he will. Guess what? I won't be playing him when he does because the L7 and the L14 Wobas will be so low, he won't even be on my list. That's how you use these numbers. So when I'm looking at the L14 Woba and I scroll down this list, I'm looking for who are the hot bats in L.A. Well, Taylor, Smith if he starts, Verdugo, Garlic if he starts. I mean, here, 425 for two weeks and nothing for one week. No at-bats for one week, basically, or no hits. Tells me he might not even be on the big club anymore. He might have been demoted to the minors. I don't know. If he's not in the starting lineup tonight, I obviously won't be using him. I don't have to go digging through Roto World and all that baloney. I'll wait till, you know, a couple of minutes here when the lineups get released. Uh, Rios might make it, and he's hitting the ball okay, right? But he's only been up for 11 plate appearances, but he's been getting some at-bats. Are they starting lineup at-bats? I don't know. He's in the starting lineup. I want a 424 Woba guy in there. 
Cody Mellinger, 413 down to a 375. Maybe you look at that and say it's overpriced. Maybe you look at it and say 375 is still pretty good. 390 up to a 510. That's a good sign, right? That's Justin Turner. Two weeks, and the, the most recent week has been smashing the ball. That's bringing this number up. It means he's getting hot, right? 435 for Muncie. 366 over the last two weeks. I'm looking for these numbers to generally be over 400 or at the very least over about 380. Does it mean I won't consider a 366? No. If I see the 366 and look over here at the shorter sample size and see that it's way above that at 430, now if it's 368, no, it doesn't count. If it's 390, probably doesn't count. But if it's like 420, 435, yeah. He's been hot this week. Use him. Hopefully this is starting to make some sense. Who was the other team we were looking at? Cincinnati? Let's look for bats in Cincinnati. Fan meter might not start. Winker hit one last night, right? 439. This 367 should change. Uh, Puig hasn't been hot lately, but he's been okay over the last two weeks. Votto, still hot. Still running good anyway. Come down here. Dietrich fell off the map. If Irvin gets a start, 376 to a 502. 372 to a 547 for Suarez. Is Suarez hot? I mean, can I get a witness? <laughs> Yes, he's hot. Use him. If you're, especially if you're including a Cincinnati stack. Who else do we have? Boston. So this is how I'm cutting down my player pool. Devers, Bradley, Bogarts, Benintendi and Holt, if they're not on the DL. Uh, Marco Hernandez, if he starts. J.D. Martinez. And then Martinez, because he's a 353 and went to a 654. For crying out loud, if that's not hot, I don't know what is. The rest of these guys are kind of schlubs. Don't need them. I mean, you could save 254 to a 523 is great for Sandy Leon. Great. If he gets the start in a spot starting, you want to wrap him with a Jackie Bradley Jr. or something like that down there at the bottom of the order, go for it. Devers, Bradley Jr., Sandy Leon. Go for it. You've got numbers backing up your play. San Diego. Now, here's what you're going to want to see. San Diego is facing a bad pitcher with high Sierra, high home run, high walk rate, whatever else, and Tyler Beattie, right? Second worst on the slate, right? And over the last 14 days, 460, 450, 420, 420, 414, 387. Oh, my goodness. There's six bats to choose from. Mix them up. Use your controlled stack and check all six of these guys into your lineup and just let DS do the rest. And look, over the last week, they're still hot. Keep using them. You don't get any better than this. Great numbers, great hot streak facing a crappy pitcher. Doesn't get any better than that. Don't be surprised if it backfires on you today and they only score two runs because those numbers aren't sustainable and they're due to cool off someday. And as luck would have it, they're going to cool off the day you decide to pick them. Happens to all of us. But on paper, if we ran this particular set of information 100 times through, this would work out. And it would work out very well for you. It is a plus EV play if I ever saw one. Dodgers, Padres, Boston, go for it. Lock them up, move on. Okay. Now that's our stacks. That's how we found out in the offenses that we want to stack. These are the guys that we want to use. If you want to play the correlation game, you might look for who's no more than two gaps apart and run a one, three, five, seven, or a one, three, five, six, or a one, two, four, six, six, eight, one, two, I mean, however you want to wrap it up, make sure there aren't two gaps in between any of your bats and you're probably okay. Don't run a one and a five very often. Now, if the one and the five were the only two on this team that were running hot, I would use them and I wouldn't bat an eye at it. Because I want hot bats more than I want them sitting right next to each other in the batting order. I don't need a one, two, three, four or a four, five, six, seven. Give me the hot bats, please. And I'll just take my chances with it. But I will look at it, and I will try. If I'm breaking ties, I will try to make sure they're not more than two gaps apart. So that's what we're doing with the stacks and how we're kind of correlating the stacks, how we're kind of working together with the stacks, okay? Because there's nothing better than having two or three guys on base and getting a double or a home run or something like that and get all those points. But what's another method that we could use to kind of catch – the entire league in case we're missing something, in case our stacks are maybe wrong. Well, we go to the batting matchups page and we do two things. Number one, we sort by DFS anchor. Because I don't need to worry about it too much, I can just take anything over an 80 
and use that because I'm not going to use some guy with some bad rating of a 64. Not very often. So I go greater than 79.9 on big slates. On smaller, smaller slates, I might go down to a 70 or 75 if that's all I can get. This is all about what the slate offers you. It's all about what numbers you're looking at and what numbers you can see you know in comparison to other numbers if your best short stop is a 74 dfsa grade it's not like you can go with no short stops you have to roster one you might as well roster the best one he might still be crap but you still have to roster him so you're picking among a bunch of baloney like we did at pitcher last night tell a lot of us ended up on some margin i mean roll a dice throw a dart whatever they're all bad all the choices stink so Pick the cheapest stinky one, whatever you want to do. DFSA grade, sort down all the way down to the 80. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to start with first base and panel. So hit the control button, you know, click the first one first, and then hold the control button down and click the C and bring up catchers and first base. If you're on DraftKings, obviously you treat them separately. I don't even use this over here on DraftKings. Catchers, first base, and whatever, make my list. Catcher and first base together, make my list. These are the guys that are over an 80. Matt Olson, Dan Vogelbach, Grandal, Ionetta, Choi. None of these guys are in my stacks today, right? Also, as luck would have it, none of them are rated over a 90. None of them have super strong matchups tonight either. If I got to come all the way down here, so, so, I mean, Hosmer was going to be on the list actually, but looking in through here, there's just not a lot. So you're going to have to maybe one off it at first base or catcher today. Right down the top, say five. Right down top five, you got Olsen, Vogelbach, Grandal, Ionetta, and Choi. And actually, I'll show you one other thing other than Grandal. Okay, so I will include the catchers again. Scroll over here. Anything under, say, 3500 bucks on FanDuel, call it a value place. Put a little dollar sign next to Matt Olsen. Put a little dollar sign next to Ionetta and Choi. I guess Grandal's right on the nose. So why? Because I'm going to, on my side sheet of paper... I'm going to be looking at my list of Olsen, Vogelbach, Grandal, Ionetta, and Choi. And if I'm starting to get to where I need help building a lineup, I need money, I need savings, then I'm going to go digging for one of those value players. Now, I've already listed them in order of DFSA grade from top to bottom, and I know that none of them are ranked over a 90, so they're all in the 80s. They're, they're good ratings, but they're not like smash city spots. Look, I've only got four names that are over an 80. So those are the four guys I'm going to use. Muncie, Holt, Moustakas, Odor. Guess what? Muncie's 100. He's not even a 90. He's 100. Does it mean he's going to go four for four or four home runs tonight? Of course not. It just means he's in a very, very, very strong spot. Is he a value play? No, not technically. Holt and Odor are. So if I really need money, it's going to cost me Muncie. But I'll tell you where my lineup building is going to start with Muncie. Why? Because he's facing... A pitcher that is bad, he himself was on the list of guys that are running at over a 400 Woba, and he's got a DFSA grade from hell. It doesn't get to be any more of a lock than that. These are the things you pay attention to as you go through these lists. Oh, another Dodger. Shocker. Suarez, whoa, shocker. Devers, whoa, shocker, right? These guys, these top four or five guys, if I scroll over here and look at their DFSA grades, one of them's a 90. It's a Dodger again. Uh-oh, probably should be paying attention to Dodgers. And then 80s, 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 80s. So if I come all the way down to like a Chapman. Shaw, Suarez, and Turner are my value plays here. 31, 31, and 23. Put a little dollar sign next to their name. Come over here. I've got Lindor, Andrews, Bregman, Tatis Jr., Whatever, nobody's a 90, so nobody maybe is like a high priority, super huge priority guy, unless I wanted to use Chris Taylor in my Dodger stacks, Xander Bogarts in my Boston stacks, Tatis in my Padres stacks. If I was stacking Padres, I don't need Lindor because he's the top rated guy. They're all pretty close. I need Tatis because he fills out my stack and he's a, he's got a great matchup. This is how we're going to start breaking some ties. This is all, I know it's a lot of information to take in. I'm trying to talk pretty slow. I'm trying to take my time and go through this for you guys and show you as we go sort of what might sway my opinion one direction or the other. Everything so far is formed around those teams that I want to stack. Dodgers, Reds, Red Sox, 
Padres. Those guys. And if I find them in these lists when I go back through the best DFSA grades by position, I'm going to put an extra mark next to them so that I'd make sure I don't miss it. I don't overlook it. Where are we at? Outfielders now? Dodger. 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 Oh my goodness. Three of the top five are Dodgers? Are you kidding me? Maybe I should pay attention to the Dodgers. Both of them have 100 ratings too? Oh my goodness. There's only five of them with a 90. And oh my god, even Alex Verdugo has a 94. All three of the outfielders are over 90. Well, I guess I know where my outfielders are coming from tonight. And again, be prepared for heartache. Bad stuff happens to good people. Matchups are too good to be true sometimes. But the bottom line is you're just stacking the deck in your favor as much as possible, and then you're just going to go let the little round ball and the little round bat meet together and hope that they hit tangent point on tangent point at the right exit velocity and launch angle to start sending balls over walls. Right? That's all you can do. But I've got a, a list because I have three positions of outfielders instead of just one position of, say, third baseman or whatever. I'm going to list about 15 of these guys. Bellinger, Peterson, Gallo, Yelich, Verdugo, Blackman, Trout, Betts, uh, Alvarez, Mazzara, Dahl, Kiki, J.D. Martinez, Puig, Cruz, Reyes, probably even down to like a Renfro. Because Renfro can hit two out on any given day, right? And he's still got a decent grade over an 80, right? How many of these guys were on my stacks? I saw some Padres. I saw some Dodgers. I saw some Red Sox. Right? So I should be fine. Now, outfield's going to be a little tough. That's where I'm going to have to make some decisions. It's a very deep position tonight. It's got a lot of grades of 90 or higher, 85 or higher. It's going to be hard. It's got a lot of Dodgers in it. Fine. Maybe I don't use Justin Turner. Maybe I use uh, Bellinger, Peterson, and Verdugo, and then come back with Suarez. Or maybe I do uh, Devers and Jackie Bradley Jr. in the utility spot, and Sandy Leone, if he's a catcher, for some serious savings, or Bogarts or something. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to cost me pit. That's what we're going to have to figure out here in a little while. But this is just another way to walk through the research station, and I really only pay attention to the grades. The one thing I will do is I will come back over here when I'm kind of done with this. Whoops. Don't know why that jumped on me. Okay. It didn't matter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over here. I'm now going to go to the 200 on 200 stuff, and I'm going to use the starting pitcher ISO tab, sort it by descending. And we see right here a pitcher has a 325 ISO to what well, he's a right-handed pitcher in Taylor Clark. Left-handed bats are his weakness. And so we see some of these names of Dodgers we recognize. We come over here, and we look under their ISO. Cody Bellinger has a 277 ISO against right-handed pitching. He's facing a right-handed pitcher tonight, and the pitcher happens to give up a 325 ISO against. It's a smash spot. Cody hits that handedness for power, and that particular pitcher gives up to Cody's handedness also. Double green light. Max Muncy, Jock Peterson. Verdugo's close to 200, right? All four of them are in play. My goodness. Scroll down a little more. There's a 280 being given up by Jose Suarez. It's a left-handed pitcher giving it up to righties. So let's see if we can find any righties in this ISO column that have over a 200. No, 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 yes. Joey Gallo. Surprise anybody he has a high power number, high ISO? Shouldn't, of course. This is a 350 on a 260. That's a huge number when we're looking for only 200 on 200. Joey Gallo would make a great one-off for you tonight. Scroll down a little bit lower, and we got a 261. That's a different pitcher. It's Taylor Clark again. Imagine that. Taylor Clark sucks to both sides of the plate, righties and lefties alike. Okay. 215 out of Kiki Hernandez. So Kiki Hernandez gets piled on the list with Bellinger, Muncy, Peterson, and Verdugo. That's five bats that are at 200 on 200 or really close in the case of Verdugo. It's a five-man stack waiting for you. Scroll down to 39, 238, whatever. So these three guys here, who's that? Suarez, Puig, and is that Devers? Okay, so it's a 239s. So this is Suarez and Puig in Cincinnati, right? 
We come down to Trent Thornton for the Boston Stacks, and you've got Devers. Come down here. Who's this? Hosmer and San Diego's close. This is a 232, 203. Here's the 250, 240, 214. These guys are all close, right? These guys are close. These guys are close. Hell, these guys are all close down here. Look, these numbers are sort of close. But if I wanted to run Hosmer, Ramirez, Lindor, Santana, Schwarber, Rizzo, Yelich, Grandal, I mean, you can't argue that they hit the handedness well and that this pitcher is close to the 200 mark, so he sort of struggles giving up power to that handedness and bat. So they're all in play, too. So I go back on my little list of my catchers and first baseman, my second baseman, my shortstops, whatever, and I start underlining or check marking or whatever. So if I go back to the catchers and first base, I've got Olsen as a value play, top-rated first baseman tonight. None of the other guys at first base really fit the key stacks that I'm looking for, so I might run him as a one-off. He happens to be cheap. Vogelbach isn't cheap, but Vogelbach is on the list. Grandal happens to be right at 3500 bucks. Fine. If I wanted to go back to the Trends tab and click on Milwaukee and see if he's running hot currently, I can do that. It might, might, it might break the tie between him and Matt Olson. Ionetta, if I wanted to get into uh, Rockies. Choi, if I wanted to stay with Tampa Bay. Then I take Muncie over in, uh, at second base. That's when I start looking at my uh, which guys do I really want out of the Dodgers. Well, I'm... If they're all running hot and they're all in great matchups, I might want the cheap ones. Um, maybe I've got money because I paid down at pitcher and I want the expensive ones. I don't know. But I've got Muncie, who is a 200 on 200 guy. He's hot right now. He's in a great matchup with a 100 DFSA grade, and he's facing a pitcher that's not good. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, Moustakas, Odor for a value play. Brock Holt, if you're stacking... Now, see, I, if I wanted to run the outfielders in L.A. and do Peterson, Verdugo, and Bellinger, or Kiki Hernandez or whatever, then I probably can't use Muncie at second base because I've filled up all of my stack in the outfield. Fine. That's where I, will. I might take Brock Holt and then come into third base. Instead of Justin Turner, I might use Rafael Devers. Maybe get a couple of cheaper Boston Red Sox who are also one of my stack candidates. So I'm just trying to think of where might I go, what makes the most sense monetarily, where can I find the value that's also in great numbers, and then where can I turn around and possibly start loading guys up again. So let's build a sample lineup because I know you guys are probably getting bored because I'm taking a lot of time here. Guy Chef. Thanks, Matthew. Ah, I clicked that ad on accident, I'm sure. Hopefully it doesn't matter. Okay, so we're on the main slate tonight, right? Let's click a dot, a dime entry. I'm not even going to enter this thing. But what did I say? Paxton, Flaherty, Stripling, whatever. If I wanted to do a cash line, we'll start with the cash line because it's going to be the hardest. Let's say we like Patrick Corbin. Actually, let's go Matt Boyd. Watch this. Down into the 20s, but not terrible. Click his game log and look at what he's been doing. 40, 20, 20, 40, 30, 50, 40, 30. Pretty consistent, right? Over his last 8 or 10 starts. Fine. Cheapest of the $10,000 guys, right? Fine. Scroll down. Hendricks, not so much. Nola, maybe, maybe not. Whatever. Odorizzi wouldn't be bad. So we've got some room to go down if we want. And now I want to start with my Dodgers stack. Probably not going to work because these guys are very expensive for a $10,000 bat. And I've only got $3,100 to do this with. But Bellinger, Muncie, see, it's not going to work. Verdugo, nope. Well, $2,600, I guess I could. Take Peterson, that probably puts me over the end. I mean, it's going to be awfully hard to fill out one, two, three, four more spots with $2,500 or less. That's very stud and scrub. So maybe I come up here and I take Bellinger out because he need I need the money. And I scroll down here, and I take Justin Turner, Kiki Hernandez. Boom. Maybe I take Chris Taylor if I want. I don't know. But I'm going to try and figure it out and play with it. It's not that important. All of a sudden, I'm at 2,900. <sighs> maybe that's doable. Maybe not. But I'm going to come down over here into Boston, which is our Padres, maybe. Let's look for some Padres. Let's look for some cheap Padres. We need some people under 2,900. So who do we know? Is that Mejia, San Diego, 
right? He didn't make the list, but at 2,200, he's a little bit appealing. Six points, six points, six points, 27 points, six, six, six. Only one zero in about his last eight or not. Fine. I'll roll with that. Saves me money. Where was he? Mejia, damn catcher. But we didn't really like catcher in first base tonight anyway. So I'll scroll up a little bit. and Let's say I wanted to see Margot. Probably not. Greg Garcia's been hot lately. Watch this. And six. Six and seven line right up together. I come up here, 6, 6, 6, 25, 6, 6, nah, he's okay. But again, only 1, 0. These are like cash game moves. These are just little value plays that are designed to get my average salary backed up. Look at that. Two for shortstop and utility. I got 3,500 to play with. Now I can take it for real again. You know, if I wanted to get rid of Greg Garcia, and I wanted to scroll up a little bit, actually, I would probably keep Garcia. Probably get rid of Mejia. I'm at 3,000. So if I wanted to scroll up a little bit, there's Reyes, Renfro, Yastrzemski was a decent one-off. Uh, let's do Reyes at 3,000. Now we're still at 3,000. That was my outfielder. Dang it. Renfro's an outfielder. Hosmer's a first baseman, I guess. Tatis Jr. is probably too expensive. But I've got, what, one, two Padres now? What if I wanted see if I can get into Boston at all, right? 3,100. Got to get under that number. Drury, Jansen, Brock Holt. Can't use him. Well, I can. Costs me Reyes. Probably okay with that if the shortstop can be... See if we can make... And there's... Dadgummit. Bradley Jr.'s not a bad one. I, I See, this is the thing. I can't let it cost me Muncie for Holt. Muncie's just too good a spot tonight. I mean, I could if I was going from away from uh, Dodgers, but honestly, or if I was just going to run these three and call it a three stack, I guess I could do that. But I probably wouldn't make that trade for a Jackie Bradley Jr. I don't mind punting a Brock Holt. These are the things you start getting into, and people wonder, well, how come you know you made this decision over that? I don't know. I rolled. The, this is why I make multiple lineups, guys. I make two or three lineups. Why? Because now I can do this, and I can fill out with my shortstop. Probably come up here, grab uh, Bogarts is pretty damn pricey. Twenty five hundred for a catcher or a first baseman. I can come all the way out to all of the catchers and first baseman available. Scroll all the way down to twenty five hundred, and I can go pick up that dude in San Diego again. Right, that little punt that's generally been getting some stuff. Generally been getting a little help. Where did he go? Austin Barnes. This is Nino. Yes, Danny Jansen, BD Castro, Maldonado's been hot as hell lately. Wouldn't be the worst in the world. Gotta click on San Diego again to find him. Little Mejia. Fine. You know, and now I've got a 6 7 stack with a 3 9. 9, 1, 2, 3. So two gaps, 1 and 2. 9, 1, 2, 3. Not scheduled to start with Kiki, so we got to watch that too. But okay, so there's one lineup, and I did that with one of the bigger pitchers. Let's say that we go back down here. We take one of the cheaper pitchers. Let's run down here to say, I don't know, I'm high on Paxton, but let's go even lower. Let's go down to Strom. Say you like Strom tonight. 3400 per player. You can go right back to L.A. if you want. Now you can probably do Bellinger, Monsi. Verdugo, Peterson. One, two, four, five. Perfect. Mm. Works out really well. And now I can go grab some value. Where can I grab some value? Cincinnati? They were one of our stacks, weren't they? Do we know of a catcher or first baseman in Cincinnati we could probably use? Hey, look, there's the Brewers as well. Let's come down here. There's Suarez at third base. There's Vado. So now I've got a 2-3 going. Where's Winker? Is he leading off? Scooter Jeanette at four. Senzel's leading off. Where's the Winker? Iglesias is down here. I guess Winker's not starting. So if I wanted to look into those guys, you know, maybe I only keep it at two. There's Puig. So if I look here, I got 2,900 for a shortstop. I can find a shortstop for 2,900 out of everybody, right? 
Rojas, Arcia, Chris Taylor, and the Dodgers. Well, I've already got four Dodgers. Simmons, Hampus, Galvis, Ahmed, Beckham, Fletcher, Iglesias, Crawford. That's another, what, Cincinnati guy. Crawford, whatever. If I don't like any of these guys, which I typically I don't right now, I might rework this. Let's find out who's one guy. Adams is okay. Crawford, Gregorius, no. DeYoung, Simeon. Andrews is not bad. Swanson, Mondesi, Baez, Lindor. Okay. So there's nothing great going to come out of that. You know, if I wanted to use Tatis as a one-off, now i got to come down here. It's got to cost me something. Is it going to cost me Votto, Suarez, Puig? Probably let it cost me Puig. Mm -hmm. 2100 Probably too cheap. So probably i got to come grab a Bellinger or who else is too expensive. I can't go at Pitcher. Muncy. don't really want to take Muncy because that short, that second base position only had four real viable options, and Muncy was overwhelmingly the best one. If I came down here, let's look at an Ionetta. 2700 Can't do it, obviously. I'm trying to think of it. It's got to cost me Bellinger, I guess. So if it costs me Bellinger, who are the outfielders that I'm going to want to use? They got an outfielder and utility, 3300 each. So if I come down here under 3300 and I start looking, well, there's Philip Irvin. We said he was okay in Cincinnati. So there's a three stack of Cincinnati. Three, two, three, seven, five, six. Probably a little bit too spaced out. Maybe not the worst of it, but probably a little bit too spaced out. Pueyo, Stewart, John Jay, Kiermaier's been good. Bowers, Teoscar Hernandez. But Tampa Bay's not on my list right now. Jared Dyson, Pilar, Byron Buxton, Santander, Ryan Braun, Jimenez has been great. Marquecas, Jackie Bradley, boom, throw him in there, and now I'm at 3,700 for a utility spot. Ideally, I'd like it to be from Boston so that I can correlate a little bit, but it doesn't have to be. See if I can find anyone at 3,700 that I like. Benintendi, Chavis, they're not on my list. Guerrero, Jackie Bradley's already on there. Pretty Galvis, Christian Vasquez. Nope, looks like it's going to be a one-off. 3,700. Upton, Mankata, Hosmer. Hosmer's fine. Dozier, Mondesi, Muncy's being used. Marte, Polanco, Santa. See, I'm just scrolling down this list looking for people. I, I could have been fine with Moustakas, right? Any of these work. They're all playing fine. And so now I've got another lineup. And I could do it a third time with a different pitcher and just keep going and going and going. And what I'm doing is I'm using my overall player pool that I built off of all the statistics. Uh, 200 on 200, trends tool. DFSA grade by position, keying on stacks that are facing bad pitchers, and then only using pitchers that are on my list of good pitchers to use tonight. And I've got a list of, if I count them up, one, two, three pitchers, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 28, 9, 31, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 41. I've got about 45 players. And that's how you cut it down. And, okay, so if Josh Bell hits three home runs again tonight, oops. If Trey Mancini hits two home runs tonight, oops. He wasn't on my list. I can't sit at home worrying about that, crying over it, and right. thinking that I messed up. My research didn't – my research wasn't going to lead me to Baltimore anyway. Why? They mm. suck. And they're facing Charlie Morton. And Charlie Morton's been solid this year. So what makes you think Baltimore would be the guys that score eight runs tonight? Nothing. Now, some Baltimore homer out there is going to have them. That's fine. He got lucky. He won the lottery ticket GPP. Good for him. He won it tonight. My goal is to be close more often than not. The closer I get, the more chances I have at being the best, and that's how I'm going to approach things. That's why I use ladders, and I use a lot of cash games in my lineups. That's why I play some tournaments, but I don't play all tournaments. Because I'm trying to be consistent and I'm trying to be close. Because I know that the more often I get close, the more often the putt will go in the hole. The more often I hit the ball out to the wall, the more often it'll sneak over the wall. The more often that I just play fundamentally sound, the more often I'm going to let everybody else taking goofy chances mess up. It's awfully hard because there's so many thousands of people out there that it's a different batch of them messing up every night. And while that batch of 100 people messed up 
and, and, and didn't win that batch over there of 25 guys messed up and got lucky. And then tomorrow night, that 25 didn't do well, but this 30 over here did, and they messed up too, and it's frustrating. I get it. But you're not in this for the short term for one day. You're in this for the season. You manage your bankroll pro appropriately to last throughout the season, and you hope to turn a profit at the end of it. And if you keep track of your numbers like I've been, 32nd percent, 78th percent, 55 38, 96th percent, all the way to the bottom, 20, you know, 27, 80, 42, whatever. Now watch this run here, 11, 13, 20, 1, 38, 15, 31, 44, 15, 53. That's another run of 11 in a row that cashed in 50-50s. You're going to go on those types of runs. Now if you're in a GPP only, min cash, min cash, min cash, this 1%, mind you, not first out of 25,000 people. Top 1%, so out of 25,000 people, maybe 250th place. And it paid me $8 on a $1 investment. <laughs> That's crap. You got to get way up into the money in the GPP to win anything. $8 across this large sample size isn't sustainable. It's not going to, I'm going to bleed through my bankroll. I need to be backing it up with cash games. 38, that's not even a cash. 15, min cash. Min cash. Min cash. Not even cash. Okay, got maybe three times my money back with that number three. Another maybe eight bucks, ten bucks. Okay, across this entire run that absolutely smashed head to heads and 50 50s at like 90%. You need to be backing your stuff up with cash games. You need to be filling in the gaps with these other triple ups, 10 man leagues, five man leagues, 100 man leagues, whatever. And then with you've got, if you've got a little bit extra in your bankroll, now fire a shot at a GPP. You might get lucky. You might. It might be you. Don't count on it. That's fool's play. Right. Count on this. Count on getting in the top half, top third, top 20% as consistently as humanly possible and grind up that bankroll. Mm. And then always have a little bit of exposure to the super, super good stuff. Mm. Okay? Hopefully this helped you guys figure out a player pool. Hopefully this showed you guys some examples of building lineups, of uh, using the research tools and all that stuff. We won't do these very, very long videos, you know, very often. I apologize for that. But it's a lot. It's a big generic question, and it is a lot to get through. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, give me some comments uh, a little bit later tonight in the Slack forums, in my channel, in the beginner's channel, whatever. Let me know if you like that. If it was way too much, it needed to be two parts. But it's a little bit hard to do today with the same player pool uh, instead of breaking it up for tomorrow's player pool and then doing it all over again. So anyway, hopefully you liked it. Hopefully we keep this video for a while. I will talk to you guys soon.